Um, hopefully that screen's shared. Yep, you're fine. Excellent. Righto. Um, so if, if people have um, logged on and, and come to find a talk about um, the new novel compounds and things from venomous animal can come to the wrong form. This is going to be more about trying to, I guess, enthuse people and see whether I can get them to come and view predominantly some work with them, which would be really nice. So first off, thanks for the invitation to, to come and chat, but I want to talk about um, a particular animal to start with, um, basically the big box jellyfish. Uh, so it's, it's an animal that's endemic to Australia. Uh, it's a jellyfish, it's square in shape. A big animal is the size of a basketball. Um, basically a big sting from one of these animals. So we're talking two to three meters of tentacle contact. You've got immediate intense pain, uh, large outstanding sting marks to the victim. Death, usually within minutes uh, from, from large stings. By and large, if you can survive the first five to 10 minutes, we'll keep you alive. Around about 70 deaths in the last 70 years in Australia. The last death was only about three or four months ago. But by and large, we can better at stopping people from eating venom and keeping them alive. So a small sting, um, so this is sub one metre worth of tentacle contact, usually just results in a lot of pain and scarring for the victim. Uh, you know, intense and immediate pain. So think dragging a red hot knife across your skin, intensifying that by a level of 10, and you're getting close to what the pain's like. However, for large stings, so, uh, and this is a, a, a fatality, uh, a small child, about 45 kilos in length, stung, there was around about two and a half to three meters of tentacle contact on the victim, and that child died due to cardiac arrest, probably sub 60 seconds. So this animal has this potential to, from a venom perspective, to cause death in humans in a very, very quick period of time. In fact, I'd, I'd argue that there'd be very few other venomous animals in the planet that can cause cardiac standstill in humans as quickly as this particular animal. From that end, um, a little bit of background now on this venom. It's a standard run-of-the-mill animal venom from the point of view in that it's a dose response effect. So if we look at human cardiac cells here that we can rear in the lab, if we look at you know, zero concentration, we have 100% survival. And obviously, as we increase the concentration of this uh, venom on the cells, you end up with an increased death rate. And this is over a period of three to five minutes. So as, as, as we would expect, uh, it's a dose response type venom. Interestingly, though, it is very, very specific in that when you compare it to cardiac, human cardiac cells versus human, human skeletal cells, uh, there's the control, this is 0.5 mil, uh, micrograms per mil and 1.5 micrograms per mil. It has a very rapid effect on cardiac cells, but a minimal effect on skeletal, human skeletal muscle cells. So there's something happening in the background. We found this some many years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and it stimulated uh, some discussions between myself and uh, Will Logging, who at that stage again is working with Boehringer in the US that maybe there might be something we may be able to look at this for finding other compounds. So to give you a little bit more information in the background of this, if we looked at what's actually going on here, the solid line is your heart rate. And we're looking here on the x-axis is time to 25% cardiac output. So measuring, this is in mice uh, using vascular dog, but looking at basically the, the flow of blood to your heart. What you find over time is the heart rate stays the same, but the stroke distance decreases. Um, and so that could be either through the, the heart contracting and not releasing, or the heart becoming more floppy and not contracting fully. Um, when you take those into account and then look at the cardiac output overall, you find that the cardiac output decreases with time, not due to the heart rate decreasing, but as I said, due to uh, this collapse of your in stroke rate or stroke depth. To give you a better understanding of that, um, one of the animals that we use routinely for testing is the cane toads. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that. One is there is an abundance of them in Australia. They're seen as a pest. But more importantly, when you, you can pith these animals so neurologically scramble their brains, their hearts will happily keep beating for the better part of two or three hours with no uh, input from anybody, just leave them on the bench and their hearts will keep beating. So it, it, from that point of view, they're, they're a very robust animal for testing things 
Um, so what I want to do here is this is a, a um, gives you a very good indication of what this woman got from here. So it's a, a neurologically deceased toe. Uh, I've cracked its chest. What we're going to do is inject venom into the ventricle. What you need to remember is toads only have three um, chambered heart. So basically one ventricle um, uh, to atrium. But um, this will give you an understanding of what's going on. As I said, the beauty with this is this neurological disease toad will keep beating for hours. So the apologies for the state of my lab, but it's sort of a, a reflection of my brain usually. <laughs> so this is a very weak solution of uh, box jellyfish venom. It, sa it says mouse, but it's actually a cane toe boxy. Now, as you would expect, the heart's going to freak out with an injection there, but it will come back and it um, gets itself organized again. Place to watch is in here. And I What I want you to notice in the background is that the mm. now the interesting thing out of that is when you look at this in certainly mammals and when we look at it in mice, it is only the ventricles that do, or the ventricles that do this. The atrium don't; they continue to beat. Um, so. To give you a little bit more information to the back end of this, this is just a standard run of the mill SDS page gel for looking at venom from these animals from the same area, Weeper in 2006, in Weeper in 2007, and the venoms are different versus Mission Beach in 2004, 2005, and again, the venoms are different. Now we know that the venoms vary between geographic locations as shown here. We know they vary between years, we also know that they vary between juveniles and adults. So again, what I'm trying to do is set the scene here for what we have from our point of view is this cornucopia, for the one that's got a word, of compounds in these venoms that are changing all over the place. What we then did is we were interested um, to see whether or not there was anything in this that we may be able to use for therapeutics. So running a standard run of mill FPLC on this, uh, basically came up with, with what looked around about six different peaks that we thought we might be able to isolate. The interesting thing being that this particular peak here, uh, which is around about the 60 to 70 kilodalton in size, is the vertebrate cardiotoxic peak. That's the bit that specifically acts on human heart cells versus that peak over here. I don't know whether you can see that, but that's the invertebrate cardiotoxic component. Now, these animals, when they're small, feed on prawns, when they grow older, they feed on fish. This is actually the FPLC out of a juvenile animal. So it has a higher component of this invertebrate cardiotoxic peak. The bit we were interested in though, was this peak too. Um, from the point of view is that it was cardiotoxic and that was the bit we were interested in from the point of view of being able to save people's lives. That was the part that we first started to play around with. Interestingly though, is we broke all of those um, components up and ran them through a standard series of, of mice models looking to see what was, what was going on. And this is the thing that first started to pique our interest when we were looking at the production of TNF alpha. And what you found was for the vehicle, we were producing higher concentrations of it. Uh, for fraction three, when we added that in, that decreased. Fraction four, which is the one I want to look at later on, that severely decreased it versus fraction six, which seemed to be or had no effect on it at all. So this piqued our interest to go, well, okay, maybe there may be something in this. So we started to pull it apart a little bit more. We looked at, if you remember, I showed you that FPLC peak, the fraction two, which is that cardiotoxic component. 
Within that, we found three other components, or three components when we look at it at a closer resolution. And, and for the sake of the argument, I'm going to call it component A, component B, and component C. And when you tested it, component A was toxic to cardiomyocytes, component B was, and component C was, or wasn't, sorry. The thing that piqued our interest was why do you want two components to start with that are cardiotoxic? That to us didn't make sense. And so we broke it down a little bit further. If we look here at, um, this is basically looking at continual, if you will, um, survival rates of human myocardiocytes, in this particular case, uh, uh, cardiocytes, percentage survival, where this green line is our control over time, and this is over uh, several hours, um, but this is a very, very weak solution versus the whole down. So you see, if we throw the whole venom in, basically we get death of the cells and they never, they, they basically don't recover. If we take component A out of this fraction and we apply it at the same concentration that was there, what we get is what appears to be, and we refer to it as a zombie death, where the cells would die, but they would spontaneously start to repeat and the, the way we're measuring would still be alive. Versus if we took component B, we ended up with the cells dying, uh, but they never ever returned. Again, started to pique our interest. We weren't sure what was going on. What happens is when you look very closely down here, what you find is component A acts very, very rapidly, but wears off very, very quickly. And usually in the, the models that we ran, we found that basically it was, it was happening instantaneously, but wearing off within about two or three minutes. Whereas component B, when you added that, took about two or three minutes to work and then kicked in, but basically nothing survived from that. Interestingly, when you run component C, which I didn't show you on this, it has no effect by itself, but when you add all three together, you obviously get the whole venom and it has a more effective effect. So there's some sort of synergy going on there. What we then did, then, what we were interested in, was this component A. So we took component A, fed it back into our cane toads, um, and this is a standard ECG for a cane toad. Um, again, the three chambered hearts, it looks, I mean, you don't need to be a cardiophysiologist to go, that looks reasonable. That's before we administer the venom. That's 45 seconds post venom and, uh, administration. Again, you don't think, need to be a cardiophysiologist or a GP to go, there is something seriously wrong with that heart rate there, something's going on. We look at four minutes, it looks pretty sad. Six minutes post venom, for all intensive purposes, that animal's flatline. And that to us was really interesting. However, the really interesting thing came out of that is we went, well, okay, those animals finished, we took the animal out of the experiment, put it in the waste, um, uh, waste bin that we were using. Interestingly, wandered off for lunch and came back. And what you tended to find is around about 180 to 200 minutes later, the hearts spontaneously started to repeat. And we look at the ECGs that we had from these animals, it looked overall as though there was something going on here. We weren't causing damage, but there was something, and there was a possible, um, some sort of heart effects that we may be able to use here. Talking to cardiophysiologists, they then suggested that there may be something in this for heart transplants. Who knows? I don't know. I'm going to leave that there. I want you to think about that. I want to then look at fraction four, which was a fraction that's not cardiotoxic doesn't seem to do anything. We ran it in some um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis mice that we were able to produce, or, um, um, produce rheumatoid arthritis in. Severity scale being zero, the mice were in no pain. Four being uh, the mice were in such pain they couldn't move around. There's our control after 38 days. We had pain scores of around about three in the mice, so in a lot of trouble. With fraction four, using only fraction four, what we found that basically after 31, 38 days, these, plant, these mice were at about the pain score of about one. So we were seeing, if you will, um, the, the pain associated with this arthritis has disappeared. What we don't know is whether or not we've actually cured the disease or whether we just removed the pain associated with that. Furthermore, we looked at that we've been looking at various concentrations of this venom for a whole variety of things. And this is whole venom. Again, if I come back and look at Heart cells, human heart cells, again, dose response effect. This is what it does in human heart cells. However, if we ran it on human pancreatic cells that had uh, pancreatic cancer, 
what you find is the venom is a lot more toxic on pancreatic cancer cells and maybe some heart cells. Again, is this something we may be able to use this for from a therapeutic point of view? We don't know. So in the grand scheme of things, as I said at the start, what I didn't want to do here, I, I, I don't have the answers for you. What I want to do is actually try and, if you will, enthuse somebody out there, hopefully somebody's listening to go, okay, there is a possibility there are some compounds in here that may be very, very beneficial. Me, myself, I'm just a dumb biologist that spends a lot of time in the water collecting these animals and trying working out the ecology. And I'm sure there's a lot more people out there with a lot more brain cells than I have that may be able to take this in a, you know, in a sort of a, a, a different direction. So uh, I might leave it there and uh, hand it back over to you. I'll just stop sharing my stream.